Okay, so thanks for inviting me and introducing me so nicely. It's all quite some time ago. So I would like to present you some results I obtained with the MOPS model that Rafaela has presented so nicely already. Thank you. Um, and in the particular focus on its sensitivity to boundary conditions and its transient spin-off behavior. And well, kind of, this is not really necessary to explain it to you. We have a global model with some circulation and some biogeochemical production. And in particular, what I think is especially important in these models is um, the formation of particles at the sea surface. So particles that move organic matter and carbon through the water column instead of with it. And on the way downwards, they gradually dissolve and release nutrients and nitrate and carbon dioxide, consume oxygen, etc. And what's happening in the model is then if part of these particles will hit the sea floor. And here we can make different assumptions as to what happens to those particles. So they might either be buried in the sediment or, for example, being kind of reflected and bumped back into the water. And this is what I'd like to focus now. How do global models deal with that process and what might be the potential effects? And as a <clears throat> brief overview, I have looked at some publications how these global models deal with the lower boundary and they are basically all three different ways. One is you have a closed lower boundary, that is you don't assume any burial of particles at the seafloor, there are a couple of models around. Then you might open up the seafloor, assume bury in the sediment of organic matter, and you might also include a specific sediment with all the details of, of um, um, bioturbation and poor water diffusion, etc. But then in particular, if you have a closed lower model boundary, you have to think very carefully and deal, decide what to do with the detritus that hits the sea floor. So some models assume it's instantaneously remineralized and other models kind of throw the detritus back into the water column, thereby mimicking some form of resuspension. And again, there are different models with different assumptions. And now thinking about instantaneous remineralization, which would release phosphate, we might also have to consider how do we deal with the oxidants? So do we do this remineralization even if we don't have any oxygen? Or do we just stop it? These are kind of severe assumptions. And again, there are some models that kind of continue realization of, of organic matter, even if there is no oxygen or they don't consider oxygen at all. Or there are models that explicitly conserve oxidants such as oxygen, nitrate, etc. And these models usually stop realization whenever oxygen runs out. All right, so a great zoo of, of, of different model types. And I'd like to focus on just a few, and that I would indeed like to start with a very old model, namely the one by Ernst Meyer Reimer, published in 1993. And that was a rather coarsely resolved model that later on evolved into the Hamburg model or Hammock. And he considered the pre industrial distributions of tracers in a, on, on the large scale. And this model also already included the phosphorus and oxygen cycle, which is quite remarkable as 1993, we don't have these computing powers as we have now. He assumed that POC remineralization stopped in anoxic waters, and he also considered a sediment layer with gradual remineralization of the buried POC. So kind of midway between open and closed. And when he analyzed the results, he noted some very interesting things. So he stated in this paper, just a collection of, of quotes, in the Eastern Equatorial Pacific, the model produces unrealistic structures. The floor is reflected most clearly in the distribution of POC, which is not remineralized due to the oxygen deficiency. 
And then he started to look for explanations for this flaw. And he hypothesized it could be the neglect of unidentified important processes, such as appetite formation, which would remove phosphate from the equatorial region, which should then be replaced from the continents. And he also noted a few other things. I'll come back to them later. But let's first have a look at kind of the removal of phosphate um, and its replacement from the site, so to say. So that led me to the question, would the permanent burial of POC help to improve those models? And in order to investigate this kind of um, almost 20 years later, I developed this MOPS model and Rafaela already told you how it works. It's very simple. It's based on phosphorus, contains nutrient, phytoplankton, zooplankton, detritus and dissolved organic matter. And um, I used it in the TMM and the transport matrix methods and all the following runs are based on the circulation or the transport matrices of the ECHO model on one by one degree grid. And the spin up time was either 3000 or 9000 years. And this model not only contains phosphorus, but also an oxygen cycle with all the um, processes involved. And the very first version um, assumed no oxygen dependent realization, that is, realization continued even if oxygen ran out, thereby assuming some unspecified oxidants. And when I tried to stop this and make realization dependent on oxygen, I ran into problems just like Ernst Meyer Reimer, and I decided to open up the seafloor and implement barrier and river run. That was in 2013. And I'd like to show you just very few results on that. So first of all, let's have a look at the effect of burial. What you see here is phosphate in the upper panels and oxygen in the lower panels. And um, these are the concentration in the very bottom layer of the model, right above the seafloor, the hypothetical seafloor. And I ran the no burial model with two different assumptions about the fate of detritus. And one is instant realization, that is every particle hitting the seafloor is being remineralized. And the other one I call resuspension, that is detritus bumps back into the water column and falls down again, et cetera, et cetera, until it eventually um, remineralizes. And when running those models over a very long time, namely these 9,000 years, or 3,000 years, I found the following. I couldn't kind of really distinguish between the two runs. They look very, very similar. And I was first surprised, but then, um, of course, it became clear to me, after such a long time, the, the rate at which detritus degrades doesn't matter anymore, whether it degrades on after year one or year 10 or year 1,000. Essentially, the uh, resulting phosphate distribution and oxygen distribution will more or less be the same. In fact, the differences showed up in the bottom layer detritus concentration. But the second thing one can note is that if you look at the phosphate distribution, red means high and um, the oxygen distribution here, blue means low, and compare this to observations, you see that the model doesn't do a too good job. In fact, it overestimates strongly the phosphate and um, underestimates the oxygen in the deep northern North Pacific. And now, if I open up the seafloor, if I assume barrier at the seafloor and uh, resupply all the buried matter after a year by the river runoff, um, then the pattern looks much nicer and compares much better to observations. Hmm. Seemed very encouraging at first, so burial seems to improve phosphate and oxygen in bottom waters. Very good. But of course, I was keen to see whether my simulated burial rates in fact match the observed ones. And what I did then is I calculated burial at the seafloor for three different sinking speeds here from slow to fast or from shallow remineralization to deep remineralization. And um, compared this to observations, these are these little dots here. 
um, on the same color scale as the model. So red means high barrier and blue means low barrier. And what you can see in particular in the Eastern Equatorial Pacific is that the model simulates far too high barrier um, at the seafloor, particularly if you have kind of fast sinking speed or a deep penetration of particle flux. So it seems as if we, as if barrier now exhibits the misfit that was formerly exhibited <clears throat> by oxygen. And we've just shifted our problems to a different corner or swept them under the carpet. We cured oxygen, but we end up with a barrier at the seafloor that seems to be a bit on the high side. So to come up and to compare with Ernst Meyer-Reimer's ideas, so we tested the removal of phosphate in particular from the equatorial region, but also elsewhere. And this indeed helped oxygen and phosphate, but the problems could then show up in simulated barrier. All right, so do we have to consider other oxidants beside oxygen? And that was in fact also already noted by Ernst Meyerheimer, who said that in the real ocean, oxygen can be substituted by nitrate or sulfate, and that this might have lacked from this model. So I started to extend the model even more and it included the nitrogen cycle. Now, the nitrogen cycle in the ocean, as many of you might know, is a kind of complicated thing with many oxidation states of nitrogen. And I'd like here to focus just on two processes that affect the nitrogen cycle quite strongly. And one is denitrification, which is happening in oxygen minimum zones, for example, in the eastern equatorial Pacific. And during denitrification, bacteria um, don't use oxygen for respiration, but nitrate. So they essentially strip the oxygen out of the nitrate molecule and use this to respire organic carbon. And thereby they reduce the nitrate concentration. And at the end of this um, reaction is molecular nitrogen. And this is something that's usually not available for phytoplankton growth. So if we just had denitrification, the ocean would eventually run out of nutrients, but nature is clever and there's another process taking place at the sea surface, which is nitrogen fixation carried out by cyanobacteria. And these guys can take up molecular nitrogen and incorporate this. And when they degrade, they release it into the water cup. All right, so this model now includes an alternative oxidant, namely, namely nitrate. The results from this model look basically like that. So here you see annual nitrogen fixation, which is basically high in the tropics and subtropics and low in the um, or zero in the high latitudes. This is because then bacteria prefer those, um, prefer um, warm waters. And denitrification takes place mainly in the oxygen minimum zones so where oxygen is low and the little denitrifiers have a competitive advantage over aerobic bacteria. So very different spatial patterns of these two processes. Now, does this help? Will the model get better? And to investigate this, one can, for example, kind of sample a section here um, along the equator from the west to the east. This is done here. This is 100 degree west, and this is the, um, I'm close to the American coast along the equator, and the line show oxygen averaged over the water column for different model setups. And if you focus just on the black line from now, so this is the model without the nitrogen cycle, and we see that we end up with a kind of considerable oxygen gap of about 20 micromole here, very close to South American coast. Whereas if we introduce the nitrogen cycle, um, things look much better. So oxygen looks much more reasonable. And again, I thought I could be very happy until I had a look at the corresponding nitrate plot, plotted in the same way along the equator towards the coast of South America. 
And if you look again at the pink line, the model with a nitrogen cycle, you see that we end up with a very large gap of nitrate um, of minus eight micromole. So the model contains far too low nitrate and essentially the problem of too low oxygen now became a problem of too low nitrate. This is not unique for this model. Other people have found this as well. Um, for example, Murat al in a paper they published 10 or 15 years ago. So to just illustrate that whatever we do, we seem to end up with the problem at least in the equatorial Pacific. So coming back to Heimer's work, we have checked the other oxidants beside oxygen and it helped in a way, but then the problem showed up in nitrate. And the final, or one of the third idea of Ernst Meyer Reimer was that um, physics and resolution. He said that the equatorial upwelling is overestimated by the physical model. Now that would be a physical process that causes the problems. And in fact, we have a model that is one by one degree, which is very likely not sufficient to resolve, for example, the equatorial current system. This has been shown quite nicely in a paper by Olaf Dutte, um, which tested um, kind of the same model that I've shown you here on a 0.5 degree orca grid for the Atlantic and on a one-tenth of a degree grid for the Atlantic and compared this to observations. This is always oxygen between 200 and 400 meters. Uh, from year 50 to year 60 of the simulation. And indeed they find that increasing the resolution looks much better in comparison to observations than when using a coarse grid. So they concluded um, um, that really eddying and fine spatial resolutions are needed in order to get the oxygen supply in particular to the shadow zones right. Okay, um, <clears throat> there's, this is very nice and we would like to have physics as good and finely resolved as possible because it's really much more realistic. The only drawback is that usually these models are extremely expensive and we've already heard about the resolution that Jamie Wilson used for very long-term scale um, simulations. And with these models, you typically end up with a few hundred years or even less, depending on how high the resolution is. So Olaf's work was run for 50 to 60, uh, for 60 years of which he plotted the last 10 years. And this, brings me to kind of the second part of my talk. When is the system in steady state? And with steady state, I mean, when is the model independent of its initial conditions? Um, at the surface, probably after 50 to 60 years, but globally and in the long term, I wouldn't think so. And in order to illustrate this, what might happen in a global model over, var over various timescales, I um, show you this plot. So here on the x-axis, you see the time in years and the log scale up to 9,000 years. And on the y-axis, you see the global average oxygen of this same model I showed you before. Um, it's expressed as deviation from initial oxygen. So what we see here is a kind of quite nonlinear trajectory um, where oxygen first increases and then, depending on the particle sinking speed, decreases either strongly, but it takes several thousand years to level out and, and get into a steady state. Whereas if we're using slow sinking, we even have a kind of turning point here or inflection point where oxygen starts to rise again and again only levels out after several thousand years. So how come, why do we get those very or quite nonlinear trajectories of oxygen? And in order to understand this, 
um, it's helpful to look at the different processes involved in the global model of biogeochemistry. And I'd like to make a brief detour on those processes. So let's start with um, ocean circulation or the global ocean origin and overturning, which is shown here, we drawn from Lumpkin and Speer. So in the center, you see Antarctica, the Antarctic circumpolar current going round and round. And then an upper cell branches off, gets into the northern North Atlantic, where it becomes salty and, and, and colder and denser, sinks down this North Atlantic deep water, mingled with Antarctic bottom water and so forth. And in the Pacific, we also have a kind of transport, circumpolar deep water to the northern North Pacific and a kind of return flow. So quite complex pattern, but very interesting to see, for example, where you have this deep convection, for example, in the Labrador and Greenland Sea, but there's no such thing in the northern North Pacific. Now, this hypothetical ocean exchanges with the um, atmosphere, um, for example, with regard to oxygen or carbon dioxide. Now, let's assume we have a clock ticking here. So that's set to zero every time a water parcel say a cubic meter of water is in contact with the atmosphere. We call this age an age of zero. These are young waters. They get the atmospheric imprint. And then they start to sink down and they lose contact with the atmosphere. And on the long way through the global ocean, they start to age. So the clock is ticking and ticking until kind of very old waters end up in the northern North Pacific. This is usually what our models do on the real ocean, hopefully, as well. Now, on top of this are these biogeochemical processes, for example, particle sinking um, everywhere on the trajectory of these water masses. And the strength of this particle sinking, of course, determines whether nutrients will be released and carbon dioxide will be released and oxygen will be respired. And then we also have these boundary conditions I've talked about before, find kind of benthic barrier and the lateral supply through rivers, for example, the Amazon, which has such a large outflow. So all kinds of different processes. And I'd like to have a very brief look at some of these timescales involved here. And what I found very enlightening kind of years ago was this paper by Karl Wunsch and Patrick Heimbach, um, who asked in their paper, how long to oceanic trace and proxy equilibrium. It's a very nice read. So what Karl Wunsch and Patrick Heimbach did is they took a global circulation model and they dyed the sea surface with some dye or ink, um, kind of setting the concentration to one over the entire ocean on the left side, one experiment, or just in the northern North Atlantic on the right side. And they maintained this concentration forever afterwards at the surface. So that's a kind of atmospheric imprint. And this star is completely passive. It has no chemical reactions or so, and just moved around with the currents. So if we run the model for a long enough time, eventually the entire ocean should contain this dye with a trace of one just due to mixing and all kinds of transfer processes. And what Wunsch and Heimbach did then is they estimated the time at which um, the tracer achieves 90% of its equilibrium value, for example, at 2000 meters roughly. So where the, the time at which the concentration becomes 0.9. And for the global injection of the tracer, they found that for the northern North um, Pacific, it takes more than 3,000 years for these waters to equilibrate. And if we inject the dye only here in the northern North Atlantic, um, it takes even longer for this signal to arrive in the deep northern North Pacific. So this global injection you might consider with changing atmospheric concentrations that are the same everywhere, Whereas kind of an input just here could be a freshwater and meltwater pools, for example, from some region in the Arctic. So different assumptions, but essentially it requires many millennia until the deep 
North Pacific feels this signal. In contrast, the biological timescales are much shorter. And just a brief example is, um, for example, here for remineralization, um, the decay of the marine diatom Cylindrotica fusiformis, um, which was investigated by Pomeroy et al. And um, Pomeroy et al made photos. So you see here this diatom and the bright little dots are many bacteria which are sitting on it. And after two days, these diatoms have um, aggregated and are heavily colonized by bacteria. A couple of days later, zooplankton <laughs> see this aggregate and find it quite delicious. And eventually after two weeks, this entire aggregate has become so decomposed that it simply disaggregates. We can get similar evidence from the lab, for example, Evers and, 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 and colleagues investigated the carbon specific respiration rate of particles, found a decay rate roughly about 0.1. So overall, for the realization of particles, we can kind of deal with timescales of days to weeks. Now these particles also sink. And what you see here is kind of sinking speed of different kinds of particles. Um, on a log scale, plotted versus the diameter, also on a log scale. The red line shows you Stokes' law and um, particles in the ocean, the organic particles usually don't sink according to Stokes' law because they are so porous and, and quite fragile. But um, they have a con still a considerable increase of sinking speed with size and overall, the range of sinking speeds varies from the meter or even centimeter size range or centimeters per day up to a kilometer per day. And these very large sinking speeds are kind of backed up by in situ observations made, for example, in the sediment where people have found that phytodetritus can arrive at several thousand meters depths a couple of weeks after a bloom. So again, we are on timescales of days to weeks, depending on the type of particle. And then finally, um, what I would also like to address very briefly are benthic and margin exchanges of P. And this is from a paper by Klaus Weimann, who investigated the budget, the global budget of phosphorus in the ocean and its supplies and, and losses. And um, you considered runoff from land and buried at the sediment. And I'd like you to just focus on two numbers. That is the river and in input is possibly around three times 10 to the 11 mole per year. Sedimentation a bit higher, whereas um, the ocean inventory is much larger. Now dividing these two numbers, just two numbers, just doing the back of an envelope calculation tells us that about 0.01% of the global phosphorus inventory is exchanged over its lateral and lower boundaries per year. Converting to time scales of 10,000 years. But the picture is not, it's a bit simplified because kind of this idea assumes instantaneous mixing of all supplies throughout the ocean. But we know that burial happens in particular places, whereas the supply of nutrients through river runoff is very localized. For example, the um, um, Atlantic Ocean receives a lot of river and input from the Amazon Orinoco from the Mississippi and also <clears throat> from the Congo River. And it takes a long time for these regions of phosphorus loss and gain to connect. And this connection has to be done by circulation and the physics. Now to sum this all up, um, there are millennial timescales associated with large scale circulation I should note air sea gas exchange is around days to months. Photosynthesis, etc., is very quick, order of days. We've seen that it takes about weeks for particles to sink to the seafloor and to remineralize. And again, when thinking about the lateral 
and um, lower boundary supply, we end up with timescales of many millennia. So great, great, great range of timescales involved. And now coming back to that trigger here, um, we possibly can explain why the model behaves as it behaves. So the initial increase in oxygen is likely due to air gas exchange, which, which happens for oxygen on the order of days. So the ocean is taking a kind of deep breath um, simply because um, it's possibly a bit cold and, and the model physics would suggest there should be a bit more oxygen dissolved in the upper water. And then oxygen starts to decline and this is due to the remineralization in connection with large scale circulation. In particular, as either slow or fast sinking occurs, um, these trajectories differ quite largely. So when slowly sinking particles decrease the oxygen, initially also quite large, but it happens in shallow waters and circulation and the physical processes can rather quickly equilibrate this with the atmosphere. And the eventual equilibrium is such that um, there's a kind of quicker route between oxygen consumption and supply. Whereas for the large particles, it takes a long time for these respired waters to come back to the atmosphere, see again the atmospheric imprint and circle around and around and around. This is where the circulation time scales kick in. And we therefore can hopefully explain why the model behaves in a quite nonlinear way. So to sum up, we find that indeed the global ocean models include many timescales from days to millennia, at least this particular model does, but I assume others as well, which could give rise to nonlinear trends in spin-up behavior. And we should be a bit aware when comparing models to observations that all model might still show considerable drift and um, it might look better at a later stage or worse, but we don't know unless we run it for a long enough time. And possibly the boundary conditions also play a considerable role for this long-term behavior. And this kind of may give rise to some food for thought because now having all these large and small scale phenomena um, in mind and these phenomena happening on, on, on short and long time scales, we could ask ourselves, what happens if terrestrial vegetation and runoff changes, kind of the Amazon all of a sudden deploying many more nutrients, when will it be felt by other regions? Or, and this is another paper which I really like, um, by Wood et al. of 2014, how might these effects, the boundary conditions and the transient behavior feed back onto the atmosphere? That is what's happening if we couple not only land, ocean floor, the ocean itself with each other, but also the atmosphere. And indeed, um, these pro um, this paper provides some very interesting results on model performance on short and long time scales. Yeah, and with this, I'd like to finish and I think I've also used my time. Thank you for listening.